Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend Uli Salazar, who is the Senior Marketing and Artist Relations Manager at Ludwig Drums. Uli, welcome to the podcast. Bart, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here uh, as a guest again on, on your podcast, and I can't say enough great things about the work that you're doing. So thank you for archiving such amazing conversations, content, and, and history about you know the, the tools and, and the instrument that we all love. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. It's uh, yeah, like you said, you're back on because you did the bl- uh, the history of the Black Beauty before, which was a really cool uh, episode that I got a ton of great feedback on. Um, and this particular one um, is getting uh, kind of a. It's been requested multiple times before by a bunch of people, but I'll just say Pete uh, Doan D O A N is the gentleman who requested it most recently, and then I think Nate Testa. Um, who's on Instagram as official snare drum geek is um, has been requesting it too. So uh, on that note, I know you kind of have uh, there. There's a kind of a couple ways we can go about this. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of history to the snare drum, but I think you've got a cool idea of how to really go super far back and give us the the whole background. So uh, on that note, why don't you just take it away and and teach us about the superphonic. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the Super is such a treasured drum by so many drummers, obviously. I mean, you can't say enough great things about what makes that drum special and unique and the history and and how many records it's been captured on. But one of the really fascinating things, particularly about that drum, is everything that kind of went into the final package of the Superphonic, kind of looking and dissecting the history and the lineage of that drum and kind of how we got there. Um, it's really fascinating. And, and to start it, you really have to, you know, go back to 1914 when the bead was born on the all metal snare drum. So Ludwig's first snare drum came out about 1911 ish, 1912. It was a flat shell, uh, brass, nickel over brass. Um, and, uh, by 1914, the drum had evolved to have incorporate this bead design, which in the black beauty episode, I talked about how that was more of a structural component to, to, um, combined the, the top and bottom half of the drum together. And it became a very prominent thing in, in the sense of the strength and durability of the drum. That's kind of how it was marketed. There's a funny ad uh, from, from the early or the, the mid 1900s of the, um, the two gentlemen kind of standing on a plank that's fixed on top of the drum to kind of show that it can support so much weight and the mm-hmm. durability of this design and so forth. And so um, as the great marketers as the Ludwigs were, you know, that was kind of one of one of the easiest ways to kind of showcase quality and strength. And that was a very important thing. Obviously, that resonates with a lot of people considering any product. And it's practical. So you can go out and stand on your drum like people do. You right. Yeah, it's exactly what you want to do with the snare drum. Don't play it. Just stand on it. Why yeah. not? Um, but it was it was a really unique way at the time to, to really showcase that point. Totally. And um, as as the drum evolved, you, you know, it, the, the beat always remained, um, remained there uh, as, as a fixture in the design. Certainly, it kind of evolved in the way of, of how, how the beat was kind of used as a joining point or, you know, quote unquote, seen to the drum. And uh, I definitely think that that beat was also a hallmark for the brand. One of those things that, you know, it was a great way for the, for the drum to stand out visually. You know, when people saw a drum with a center beat, it's like, oh, that's a Ludwig, you know? Yeah. And I think unique design elements in a drum that stand out aesthetically as well are a great way to kind of put your brand stamp on something and for it to be recognizable. So I do really think that one thing to consider in, in the course of the history of not just the superphonic or the snare drum, but the brand in general is that reputation is everything. And so for those that know the history of the brand and kind of how it changed hands and ownership throughout the time, um, one of the things that was always a, a focus is the integrity of your reputation and reputation is everything. And so you really have to lean on that, not, not only through, through word of mouth, but in through the way people sort of experience your product visually. And so I think there is a lot of just premier sort of signature stamps in the product that um, went a long way in describing and positioning the integrity of the brand. And so I think yeah. the beat is one of them. And I think it's important to, to highlight that, you know, 1914, uh, the birth of the bead, and it remained a constant in all of the Ludwig snare manufacturing, you know, up until when it sold to Ludwig and Lud- or CG Con and became Ludwig and Ludwig. Um, and then even when WFL 
or when when senior kind of broke off from cg con and started wfl their first initial all metal snare drum designs also incorporated the beat so going back to reputation i think the reason why that kind of carried over as a constant is because when people saw that beat, they knew it was a lot of drum and even though during the wfl era they weren't technically you know um uh through legal purposes uh weren't able to brand the drum as a Ludwig drum, it still had those stamps of, of who was at the hand or, or who was behind making that particular drum in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's super important, too. It's like, it's funny because Ludwig never really thought about that. You think about the the history of like, you know, the bass drum logo that everyone sees on TV and stuff. All Ludwig is very visual. I mean, even obviously they did the, the whole acrylic drum thing is it's a whole history. But just you see the acrylic drums, you usually think Ludwig. You see the bead, you think superphonic. And you can see that from, you know, 100 feet back in an audience and go, oh, he's playing a, a Ludwig superphonic like we all look and, and notice. Um, so I don't know if that was on purpose or it was just a happenstance of, uh, you know, this is a visually striking bead that goes around it. Uh, it just doubled as a, um, as a visual cue because people liked it. Cause sometimes if you just see a wooden snare, you don't really know exactly the brand if you're not, you know, a, an ultra drum nerd and know the lugs and stuff. So that really, um, definitely served double duty and, and let people know what people are playing without a doubt. And, you know, back then you obviously didn't have social media and, and all the ways of sort of, um, getting to product specifics. Um, and you know, it was more word of mouth back then, right. Or yeah. through print magazine. And so the more you kind of leaned on putting your stamp in a, in a design, um, the more that sort of carried over beyond kind of word of mouth or helped uh, word of mouth sort of carry on. It's like, Oh, it's Ludwig drum. It's got this beat and it's got, this kind of hoop and so on. So um, this is one of the fascinating things. I think any product designer is always focused on when designing a product. It's like, okay, this is cool that it's got all of these um, features and benefits for the customer. But what are one of those things that are a standout that are that kind of stamp the product as uniquely this brand, you know, whether it's the function design or the aesthetic. And when you can combine that, you know, it goes a long way. And I think there's a lot of premier brands that have done that and historic brands that have done that. You look at, you know, a pair of Levi's jeans, there's so many things about that particular denim design that you just talk about, you know, that, that stitched uh, uh, rear pocket. It's like, it's all you need to see to know it's, it's a, it's a Levi jean to think that's a quality pair of pants, you know, kind of the same thing went into the snare drum design back then, I think. Yeah, exactly. Which that's, I mean, that's the, the test of a good brand. Um, okay. So, uh, 1914 is where we are, which is it's really cool to kind of think as you think of supraphonic, you think of, I believe, 1964. But like we're earlier than like really what we think of as like the modern drum set. Uh, so what's the next big milestone after 1914? One of the interesting things to look at is 1935. And that's when the Imperial Lug is born. So at this point in the company's timeline, it is under the uh, CG Con ownership. And so it's a Ludwig and Ludwig drum. And this is the 25th anniversary of the brand. Uh, the Imperial Lug is born. And I don't know too much of the specifics and, and, and the actual facts, but there's a lot of things through the course of the history that make me believe that the Imperial Lug was a Ludwig Senior specific design. Um, and we'll kind of get to why, you know, there's hints throughout history, but I've never really heard or read any documentation, like hard documentation of the fact that, well, yeah, Senior designed that lug solely. But I think it was something that he admired to a pretty great extent because it would end up being incorporated when they buy the name back, the rights to the name back from CG Khan in the 50s. So one thing to bear in mind, but yeah, 1935 Imperial Lug is born. And so now you have two pieces in existence that would end up, you know, coming forth in the 1964 model Superphonic. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that that lug is very iconic. And and but you know, you also think too, people maybe didn't document stuff as well back then and say, oh, he invented this, or it's more just like it's just churn it out. And when you're the, the the company's named after you, you probably don't really like put your claim it's kind of assumed that you have a hand in everything, you know, right. to some degree. Yeah, exactly. And I think this goes back to the point of reputation and putting your iconic stamp on something. So to your point, like you said, when you see an Imperial, like you're like, oh, it's a Ludwig. And you know it's it's a big deal drum when you see an Imperial lug. Like. So now at this point, you see, you know, remnants of reputation in the beat. 
and now a lug, you know, so I think those two over time became very well regarded and respected. And so they were very critical in the re reputation of the brand um, and showcasing the quality of the, the, of the, of the product. And um, I think, you know, that uh, the word of mouth continued to, to build that, you know, if you if you want a great drum, these are the things you look for and it's the stamp of the brand. So, you know, you're, you're, you're playing the right brand at that point. Yeah. And there was a ton of competition. There's a lot of different oh, yeah. brands that were around that. I mean, there was even more. I mean, there's a ton of iconic brands now, but as far as like American drum brands, because people weren't importing really as much then because that's right. going on a ship and all that stuff. But uh, there was a lot of competition with the, like, I mean, Slingerland and Leedy and, and Wahlberg and Ajay and all these brands. I mean, um, so you did have to stick out a little bit. And uh, I'm sure that uh, competition uh, really pushes innovation forward. So I guess we're, we can be grateful for the, com the competition now because we get all this cool stuff. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, um, even you had your large scale manufacturers, like your Ludwigs, your Ladies, your Gretsch's even, um, and Slingerland by the thirties. Yeah, they were full scale, but I, I, there was also a lot of micro type builders as well that were tinkering and selling their designs to some of the larger companies and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, really fascinating time in history. And, and I don't think it's any different than what the drum industry looks like today um, as far as drum manufacturing. But a good thing that to kind of go back to is uh, in 1935. So the Imperial Lug is born and it's only a matter of about a year or two at that point that Senior leaves Ludwig and Ludwig and starts his own company again, moves back to Chicago and starts the WFL drum company. And this is where um, early on, I think the first catalog was 1937 or 38, and they already got back into manufacturing metal drums. Obviously, they kind of started their um, uh, their metal drum manufacturing in 1911, 1912. And so, you know, along with the wood shells that they were making, they started making metal drums in 1937. I believe the the model that they called it was the all metal drum. And this was a really fascinating drum that they used at the time because it had, I don't know what the official name is for the slug, but it was used on like the swing model snare drum, so which was a wood model. And it had a very, it had um, a very familiar look in the sense that where it had kind of like the ray sides that the Imperial lug has and sort of the hard lines and kind of that Art Deco vibe, which again, kind of leads me to wonder that there was something with the Imperial lug design wise that carried over to this new beaded lug design of the late 1930s, early 1940s. And so I think there was, you know, he, uh, Ludwig was, was trying to sort of um, mirror or kind of emulate some of those design aesthetics and that design approach to the lug from an aesthetic standpoint. So yeah, they were making these drums, they were still made out of brass, but now at this point it's, it's a beaded lug. You have this new kind of quote unquote swing model lug on it um, and they're brass shells. Uh, again, so uh, and then this is where you start to see the the Keystone Bash come into place as well, um, and then you know that's in production for a number of years until we get to you know the challenge with metal supply because of the war and supporting the war efforts and such. So about 1942 ish, I think is when they made the hard transition to most most of the componentry being made out of wood. But in 1941, they introduced the, the Zephyr lug, which was very short lived. It was an aluminum casing, I believe, and it wasn't all that durable. They used it on beaded drums again. Um, and that was uh, uh, mostly, you know, nickel over brass or straight brass uh, drums. And so then we get to a very big gap in the manufacturing of metal snare drums because of the shortage. Um, and so we move forward to, about the 1950 era as like, you know, that's a decade of transition. A lot of people characterize that for the brand. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that, that is, it's, it's been talked about so much on the show with the world war two stuff, but it's, uh, everyone got kind of shaken up with that. And it makes sense that a, all metal snare drum might be put aside to make like, <laughs> you know, things for the biggest war in, 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 in world history. Uh, yeah. one of the, one of them, but, um, yeah, that's cool. I'm fascinated by the whole WFL, the transition and all that stuff. I'm actually working on an episode with Kurt uh, Ekstrom, uh, who wants to do a WFL specific episode um, cool. because it's sort of like it's just such a bizarre like, you know, you can't use your name. You can't use you can't use a lot of the stuff that you've invented. We own it. It's just it's sort of a 
it's just a weird position to be in, you know? So I'm, I'm excited to learn more about that. Yeah. So it's really cool. Now, you know, we, we got up from 1914 to about 1941 and between this time, you know, you see the exterior, you know, shell kind of aesthetic form. You see the lug that's utilized come to fruition and you see the badge that's utilized for the super bond to come in, yeah. come to fruition. So pretty cool. I mean, you, you really, when you think about that drum, you really got to look even further back. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Cause it's so many little pieces and elements, especially with the keystone badge and everything. And that, that bead going back. I mean, you know, it's nuts to, to think to 1914 up to, uh, the 1935 when they're hitting their like 25th, um, anniversary in 35, I think you said, right. Yep. Um, God, it's such an old company and there's so much trial and error along the way. So, so it's cool when you play superphonic, you're really playing full on Ludwig history every no time, doubt. you know? No yeah. yeah. And it's really cool. Cause it's, it's, it's not, you know, linear history. It, it's very hybrid in the sense, like there's pieces from the WFL history and there's pieces from, you know, the CG Con era and there's pieces from the Ludwig and Ludwig era when it was obviously Ludwig and Ludwig because of the brothers. But it, it didn't become just uh, just Ludwig until Ludwig bought it back, right? It, because it was under TG Khan ownership, it was it was Ludwig and Ludwig, and then it turned into Leedy and Ludwig by the 1950s. Yeah. Um, and then when when uh, William F. Ludwig Sr. bought back the rights to the name, then that's when it kind of stood up as just Ludwig. Yeah, which is what we we all know. But it's kind of funny because now you look back and you just kind of put it all in one Ludwig box, but <laughs> it's had such a long history of switching around. And I mean, I would imagine though, with all that competition, it was, it was, it's hard. And this is so long ago, it's hard to say it, but I mean, Ludwig, their snare drums, wood or metal had to be kind of industry standard. I would imagine. I think people loved them throughout all of time because the superphonic we know is such a recorded and, you know, everyone loves the Supra, but like, I, I'm, I'm assuming before that their snare drums were still very popular uh, used by obviously there were other brands that were being used, but they had to before that be very very well respected. It's not like they they hit on the Supra and people were like, oh, they got it right this time. Right? <laughs> like, no, a hundred percent. And and that goes back to what I said about reputation. Like reputation yeah. is everything. So not only were they focused on building a reputation uh, in the product that kind of spoke for itself, but as themselves, you know, they they put in a, back then it was all about grassroots efforts to build your name and build integrity around your name and your brand. Yeah. So they're very well respected at that time. And so when you look at, you know, the successes that that brand has had, a lot of it comes down to the product standing up to what they, how they sold it. So yeah, it was a success. And so it was very important for them to very much capture those achievements that were kind of tied and any whether it was aesthetic um in in sort of those brand and like feature hints um or in the name of the brand that's why the name was so important because they like everybody knew it's a Ludwig it's a big deal you know and and they they built that themselves and that goes a long way so for senior I don't think it was something that was very easy for him to let go like you know I worked very hard to build and prop you know these components up in the um in the drummer market yeah. And, you know, it was a mission for him to really preserve the integrity as much as he could, even if he had to fight, you know, tooth and nail to get it back, even if it meant, you know, you kind of had to bend backwards to, um, you know, buy back the name. I'm sure that wasn't cheap at the, at the time, you know, buy back the rights to the name or buy back even the, the, the tooling for the Imperial look, because that's one of the other things that came with um sort of that transition period and buying back the name they did buy back a little bit of tooling for some product and the imperial lug was one of them wow talk about a humbling experience you're like buying back everything that you built and made <laughs> <laughs> like this should be mine but right um all right so we're in the 50s i think is where we left off post-war uh kind of getting uh building things back up into having a metal drum and that not being like, you know, a big deal to like, you know, you're hurting the war effort by doing that. So right. um, yeah, take it from there. Yeah. So 1950s is kind of a, a very confusing decade uh, when you look at it because of the evolution of, of the brand. So at this point, 1950, yeah, I think was the last time Ludwig was, was cataloged as a Ludwig and Ludwig brand under the CG Con ownership. And um, then by 1951, it becomes Leedy and Ludwig, which I'm sure was like 
very, very upsetting for senior to see that. Like you, you just, you just kind of, you know, bastardize the name at that point. Like mm-hmm. it, it's, it's now a mutt of a brand, you know, it's Levy and Ludwig. Like I'm sure that was an eyesore for him to see that name because yeah. to him, he's like, Hey, I worked my entire life to, to build this name to what it is. And it kind of needs to live as that Ludwig legacy. So I think, you know, that, that prompted the urgency to get the name back and figure out how we can do that at, at, by any means necessary kind of thing. So I don't think it was easy at all to do that. But um, by this point, you know, they were, they were, uh, Lydia and Ludwig was making metal drums. Um, they were starting to make more of it. They introduced a reliance model in 1951 and a util- utility model that also had the Imperial lug, but they were flat shells. So there's a lot of things that they kind of stepped away from that I think were like brand hallmarks that, um, I'm sure didn't resonate all that great for, for Singer, but he saw that as an opportunity. He's like, oh, they're stepping away from the iconic beaded shell. Now that's becoming my own. They're still using the Imperial lug, you know? Yeah. Where is there an opportunity to kind of get that back? So yeah. 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 1951 is, is kind of where you see a lot of the transitions and separate and some separations kind of start to occur. And then you get to 1958 where they sort of resolve, you know, the purchasing and the rights and getting the rights back to the name and everything's kind of solidified and finalized so that they can bring the the super series snare drums, which are kind of the predecessor to the super fine. Yeah, that's actually interesting. Um, I'd love to hear more about the actual the super series itself, because obviously from the name from Supra super, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, maybe like let's just jump in there and like how long the super existed before becoming the Supra. And uh, and let's let's hear more about that. Yeah, no doubt. The, so the Super Series um, uh, was released in 1958. And that was that was a point uh, by then that um, Senior had bought the rights to, to use the name again and, and rebranded uh, essentially WFL drums as just Ludwig drums. And again, as I said earlier, reputation is everything. Yeah. You know, he obviously built a reputation under the WFL umbrella, but nothing stood stronger than the Ludwig brand. And as you mentioned, you know, them, it, it probably was a very successful brand early on. And, and yeah, I think if it, if it managed to survive the Great Depression and, and beyond, like there was a very strong reputation uh, for the brand and affinity for the brand, I think, at that point, which I think still made it very important for a senior to to have that reputation that he built and yeah. obviously you know the, the 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 rights to his name and to market a drum with his proper name yeah. i think goes a very long way so this is where you start to see um just the the keystone badge now have ludwig and not wfl and you see the script logo kind of come into fruition um in in the badge itself it is a blue ink badge. Uh, this is, they call this a transition period. Um, so this is before you sort of see the stamped um, kind of embossed uh, Keystone badge from the 60s. And in 1958, the Super Series is introduced. And it's introduced as a um, brass model, polished uh, lacquered brass model, and a nickel over brass model as well in two sizes, five and six and a half by 14. And so this is where you, you kind of see the history we had just uh, went over in the early, earlier part of, of, the, of the brand. Um, it all kind of comes together here. So yeah. beaded shell in the Super Series, Imperial Lug, um, and a Keystone Badge. So this is where it, during this transition point, this was the, also the first time that the Imperial Lug was used um, on a quote-unquote Ludwig branded drum. And so I do believe that this was a very important feature for senior to bring back. Cause remember during the WFL era, he didn't, it was the CG con Ludwig that was using the Imperial look, not WFL. Yeah. So I think, I think a, a part of this, this sort of um, uh, purchase of, of, of the rights to the name uh, there, it is known that some tooling and some machinery was bought to help manufacture drums again. Um, but I, I, obviously the, the tooling and the design of the Imperial was came with this purchase as well and needed to be on the table, to my opinion, um, for their future designs. And I think, you know, when you kind of look at what that lug was on, I mean, there were some really pretty drums, you know, and so I'm sure aesthetically it was something for him that he felt, you know, we need our hands on this to, to kind of build a very uh, well-regarded and well-presented professional level drum. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like it's like, uh, in the evolution, it just looks more like a modern drum 
uh, just the way things were put together and those elements all coming together. And, and on the Ludwig site and the kind of history, it says originally released as the answer to every drummer's dream. <laughs> There's something about the keystone and the imperial lug and the bead. It's just so like it's just perfect. It's just right. Yeah, you know? aesthetically, it just has the vibe and, and has, you know, transcended time. Right. I mean, you look at the history yeah. of it and it's still one of the coolest looking lugs in the game. Like it's just, it's yeah. just got such a vibe to it. The art deco presentation has really stood the test of time, uh, which is really amazing and fascinating to see. So yeah, you get to the super series, you know, that kind of lives on it's a brass drum. You know, the design of, of that drum is a little bit different on, on, what the shell design is once you get to the superphonic. So we, we could talk a little bit about that. You look at the sure. super series, um, as I mentioned, it's a brass shell. Um, and unlike some of the earlier brass shells, like 1912, when the first beat drum came out, these are not tack welded at the beat. They're, they're, they're joined at the butt, they're welded there. Um, and the snare bed on these are stamped into the shell. So there's a very noticeable hard groove um, at both the, the snare throw and the snare um, butt plate uh, ends of the drum. And then the bearing edge is also uh, flanged twice. They call it tuck. Um, so once over, obviously, to form the apex, and then once again underneath it. Um, I'm not sure what the sonic principle is of, of that. I don't think there really is any because it doesn't come into play. Uh, but I'm sure it, it helps the functionality. Obviously, brass is a little bit softer. So having that extra rigid tuck, I'm sure will kind of help the um, the strength of that edge. And then, you know, that so that's that's kind of the makeup of of the um of the uh the super series. It also has the P83 throw off that that comes into play uh for the for the first time there on, on those drums. Can I ask you about that the P83, the throw off there for a little bit? Because I mean that that maybe like I'm not an expert on throw offs at all, but that really was a very popular and kind of modern throw off. Like what was that, the P83, like compared to other throw-offs at the time? I mean, was it a complete game changer? Like they kind of moved everything forward or, you know, how, how did that compare to other throw-offs of the Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the ease, the tension knob, um, obviously adjustment play, made that, that particular throw-off mechanism um, really user-friendly. Uh, in that sense. And I think to have that level of, of adjustability with, with, with ease goes a long way. Uh, Ludwig was the first company to, to invent the lever throw off in the early 1900s. So those early beaded drums were also the first to incorporate a lever throw. Um, so that kind of always stood through a majority of their designs. Um, they had some really unique throw offs, obviously, throughout the decades up until the Super Series. But I think that was just a very you know, simple design with not so many moving parts like some of the early or like swing model throw-offs that were like double lever and stuff like that. And you kind of had more on-the-go adjustability to that with, with the tension knob um, as opposed to, you know, getting a ratchet key or some, some other devices to kind of adjust uh, the tension of, of the wires. I think it was just a little bit more user-friendly of a design. Yeah. Kind of seems like after that, it, it, it didn't, it cha it's changed a lot over time, but that was sort of the prototype of like, this is what we're going to use for the modern throw-offs going forward. Totally, yeah. It was a very sim simple um, design and not too overly complicated that allowed and gave you the uh, everything you needed, essentially, for snare, snare tension adjustments. Yeah, totally. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols creates B20 and truly hand-hammered symbols for today's working drummer. Each handcrafted symbol has a warmth that draws you in at low volumes, yet thunders with beautiful overtones when leaned into and opened up. These symbols come alive with an explosive attack, but have undertones that are warm, rich, and dark. Each one has a unique, complex voice that will help you define your personal sound. The symbols speak clearly at all dynamic levels and sit comfortably and easily blend in any mix. Head over to dreamsymbols.com or at dreamsymbols on Instagram and find out what your dream sounds like today. So we moved past Super Series earlier, part of the 60s, 60 to 63. They're still making those drums. And this is where you start to see um, the Ludwig Keystone badge that is uh, got the stamped um, sort of raised uh, script logo and such. And throughout 61 to 63 is kind of when they started the development of the aluminum shell design. And what kind of forced them to kind of look at this a little bit more was the cost of brass. Brass 
fairly easy to work with because of how, how malleable the, the alloy is compared to others. But it was also um, a lot more accessible cost-wise and allowed them to produce a really great product at a really great price. Um, and the, obviously, you know, co material costs always uh, change um, through time. And, and brass at this point was starting to, to be a little bit out of the sensible price range, I think, for a snare drum. Um, at that time. So they started looking at aluminum and started to figure out, you know, how, to, how they wanted to process this material. And I imagine, you know, uh, taking into account the kind of finish it needs, the shell construction that it's going to need, and all of the specifications that it needs to kind of operate as a luxury professional yeah. drum. One thing that you can't ignore in, in the history of Superphonic is the acrylite as well, because that was, that was the first aluminum drum. But that, that came out of all of their need to sort of solve for a much cheaper, much more economically priced metal yeah. drum. And um, the aluminum uh, acrylite came out in 1963. So one year prior to the Superphonic. Mm, interesting. And that came out as a budget student um, model snare drum, right? Came prepackaged with all like the percussion ed kits and stuff like that. So that particular drum though was, was, very different and and cost less because of what was involved and in, in the amount of work that goes into uh, manufacturing that particular drum. You had less lugs, so less drilling, less you know material cost that goes into it. Um, that used a beaded twin lug as opposed to the imperial lug. Now the twin lug design um, that was a, a, another Ludwig uh, proprietary design, but under the WFL uh, era. So after the war, when they go back to making lugs out of metal, sure. That's when they designed the classic lug that went on toms and then the twin lug, the bow tie lug, people call bow tie lug. So yeah, throughout 1961 uh, to 1963, development on the Super is taking place and they're able to go to the market um, relatively quick with the Acolyte model uh, because it was, it was pretty bare bones compared to the Super. There wasn't the chrome finish on it. I believe uh, the earlier finishes on the Acolyte were anodized. Um, so you kind of had that, that kind of... Um, the darker uh, gray finish to it, you know, it didn't have the same sheen qualities that, that a chrome plated drum has and stuff like that. So yeah, eight, eight lug configuration, the same shell type, um, with the exception of the earlier prototypes, they were, they were constructed a little bit differently, but it was a seamless, a seamless shell. And so, as I mentioned, super series were, were welded, but at the butt end brass and then earlier beaded shells were welded at, at the, uh, at the bead. Um, by 1963, and, and by the time they kind of saw for the Acolyte and Superphonic, this was at Ludwig's first time using a seamless shell. That's a very important thing to understand that, you know, all the snare drums prior were, were, were not seamless. This was their first seamless spun uh, all metal shell uh, by 1963. And so that's what really made the drum really unique. I think one of the things that they zeroed in on was, you know, the the, the pureness of the sound. You know, there was no... Uh, overtone distortion and the way the drum resonated. Um, and it was a, a very, very just pure, crisp tone to the drum. Yeah. Man, that's a lot of stuff happening. 63, 64. <laughs> I mean, this like the Acrolyte and the Superphonic. I mean, that is like, as far as like um, iconic snare drums, that's a good couple years there for Ludwig. No, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, good years. And things move so fast. It's crazy to see where they didn't have the modern day machinery to move product as quickly as we can today. Like they move things pretty quick back in the day, which is really fascinating. Yeah. We should do an Acrolyte episode down the road of just purely <laughs> Acrolyte. But totally. was was that uh, a super successful drum right off the bat? I mean, I'm assuming people obviously were using that really mainly as a what it's intended for like a student model yeah and i think so because of, of price point as well yeah. like accessibility is everything so when you can bring something to the market that's priced at a very accessible price point you know you can move through quite a bit of product and you can get in the hands of a lot of players so again that that move away from brass allowed them to do that you know to bring a drum into the market that can position at a more appropriate price point for you know, up and coming students to learn, even schools, you know, to buy things like that. And it's the classic, like, okay, you're on an aluminum snare and then you, you like it. And when it's time to upgrade, they're going to buy the drum that they like and that they've played the whole time. They're going to upgrade to the next, you know, uh, Ludwig snare drum. Cause it's the brand recognition and the name recognition. And, uh, it kind of is a good, um, you got to have somewhere to start. You can't start at the, the top of the line. Um, but all right. So Superphonic. I mean, we're there. 
We're uh, <laughs> <laughs> we made it. We made it. 1914 yeah. to 1964. Yeah, yeah, we finally make it to the Superphonic, and this is cool because you know you see a lot of design elements come together, but you also see you know a lot of design first kind of happen from the development of this particular drum, the seamless shell. This is the first time you know that Ludwig starts incorporating the seamless shell, as I mentioned, and um, this is also when they move away from the stamped um, snare beds as well and they're kind of more gradual they're very hard to tell that there is even a snare bed there and that was part of you know the quote unquote the secret sauce that Ludwig marketed it's like this new snare bed made you know the the drum that much more responsive and that much more sensitive um to to the performance and so those were the 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 really big things to call out in the um uh the catalogs you know the the seamless shell crisp attack um you know focus uh as well as the sensitivity you know that went a very long way so um really really great um great design that that helped set a benchmark for other future design drums uh moving forward because essentially the the black beauty of you know the late 70s onward started to emulate that same uh design in the sense of it incorporated that that new bed style right so that, that's kind of where we we got our benchmark snare bed design at that point in history as well. Yeah. I mean, all right. So I know you weren't alive in 1964, but like, uh, I mean, public reaction, like, was this instantly like, uh, as far as you know, was this like the end all be all snare drum that everyone was going to use that was super popular or was it a kind of a progressive growth? You know, from what I can tell, I mean, the Ludwig just had such a great way of marketing throughout time. Like that is just one thing they knew how to do. They knew how to promote a product. Uh, but not only that, they knew how to make a quality product. So when you have a really great quality product and you have a really great narrative going with it and, and you're able to connect with an audience, you know, nine times out of 10, you're going to have some really great success. And so I think at the time that this, this drum came out, um, they were very aggressive in their grassroots efforts of getting this product into retailers, getting this product into schools and so on. And so the fact that they put this very aggressive effort um, to push this product down to the marketplace, I think helped it really pick up a lot of steam. You know, they also started when the Super came out at that time, cataloging a lot of their drum sets, their catalog configured drum sets with this drum. Yeah. So if you bought any set, like it came with a Supra. Yeah. So I think that, that kind of forced that drum into the hands of, of people as opposed to, you know, outfits in the past came with like wood drums. They decided let's put the metal drum with it. So I think that put the drum in the hands of more players um, than if they just left it to a you know single purchase option where it's like, oh, if you want a metal snare drum, we offer it here. It's like, no, we offer it standalone, but we also offer it in, in a package. Yeah. And so I think I think that sales approach to things, you know, helped really put put the drum in, into a lot of the right hands and instances that kind of allowed it to get the reputation that it did. And and when people got their hands on the drum, I mean they, no one heard anything like it. Seamless aluminum shell. Like nobody was doing that uh, back then. You know, they weren't the first ones to do a seamless shell, but it was the first time they, you know, they did their their version of a seamless drum. And aluminum is just such a such a user-friendly alloy. You know, brass is a little unforgiving. You know, if you don't know what you're doing tuning-wise, like those overtones are very unforgiving. Aluminum is a lot more easier to work with, it's a lot more focused sound, uh, definitely a lot more uh forgiving. And it's just such a great mid-range tone, you know, tuning wise, you know, it's not, it's not the dark timbre that you get out of brass, it's a little bit brighter, a little bit popular, a little bit snappier. And that's a very pleasing tone to the ear, just as much as brass is. Yeah. Kind of a Swiss army knife of drums where you can like, uh, sort of use it on everything. You can, if you're in the studio, you can have it out and use it on multiple tracks, which is probably why, I mean, it's kind of like in that, um, it's the le the legend of how it's like, you know, it's the most recorded snare in history or it's one of the most recorded snares in history, um, which I've learned to not say something is the most of anything. Uh, <laughs> but it it is just it's like someone I mean, you just grab it and you can leave it on. And 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 like you said, user friendly, because just because you're a big famous recording drummer doesn't mean that like you're great at tuning. All the people have techs a lot, but like just to be able to like make it sound good fast and change it a little. Um, the studio I work at, we had one forever and I used it on a ton of recordings and it would just stay on. It would just like 
why switch it out? I mean, obviously you'd switch it to something where uh, if different sizes were needed, but um, I don't know, man. I mean, people just want something that's easy and nice. And, and I really like how you were talking about how it came with the drum set. Cause you take, I mean, that's like a marketing, it's not even marketing. It's just like on many levels, it's like it, it's good for consumers. You're buying a drum set, you get a nice snare drum. You don't kind of like just get a drum set with a snare drum and they kind of like, this is cool. It matches. I'm going to set it on the shelf and put on my, whatever my preferred snare, but oh no, you got to keep, you got the good snare. <laughs> very <laughs> yeah, smart. And it's, it's very interesting now because most professional kits today don't come packaged with the snare because it's yeah. such a personal thing, yeah. right? Yeah. That, like you can't, you can't tell a professional drummer what snare drum he should play. Yeah. You know, they're good. They're going to kind of want to find their sound. It's a very, it's a very specific thing that I think is very unique to a lot of players and part of like, you know, their, their player profile. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Supra just worked. And, and I think uh, you know, all the right things came together uh, the way that they positioned it at the time, you know, with it being a chrome plated um, snare drum, it, you know, it was a very universal look. It was a very neutral look. So yeah. it, fit, it sat well behind a white Marine Pearl kit and it sat well behind a blue sparkle kit. And it made sense with, you know, all of the supporting componentry and a woodshell like lugs and hoops being, you know, chrome, chrome finish. Like it just kind of fit fit the aesthetic yeah you know and fit the the the, the visual um the visual vibe and 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 profile like effortlessly oh right? man and we're very visual people that's a big part i <laughs> yeah. mean like of course we want it to sound good but it has to look good i mean it's 100%. so important and it's just it is timeless um i don't know i mean so all right let's talk about the the response because it overnight it wouldn't become the most recorded snare and can you address that claim what is the actual i mean am i wrong on that or is it number two i don't even know how someone would really keep track of that right exactly i think you keep track of it by seeing the players over history that have that have played it and how much documented yeah. work they've done and when you look at some of the players that that are known to have recorded and played on a superphonic uh, and or a black beauty i think that the superphonic is more documented sure. in the black beauty so i would say the black beauty is more second and the supra is, is first as the most recorded but i mean it, it it's hard to to say otherwise because you look at all the work that hal blaine recorded on all the hit i mean he was one of the biggest session drummers of the 1960s and then you look clyde stubblefield and then all the work that clyde stubblefield you know all his work was sampled in hip-hop totally so and then, you know, John Bonham, Bill Ward, Ian Pace, Karen Carpenter, Roy Haynes, like all these heavies. And that's just like speaking like 60s and 70s and you get into the 80s. And then you get into that, into today. Like you can't go into a studio and not see a Supra. Yeah. I mean, you said you worked at a studio. And, it had, and I mean, so nine yeah. times out of 10, um, a drum was there um, that um, that was utilized. So uh, I, I feel like you go to any, almost any studio around the world. And you're going to find it a superphonic, and 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 that fact alone is is why it, it's hard to not say that's probably the most recorded drum. Yeah. But also looking at obviously all the players where we've known it's been documented that they've used it. Yeah. No, that's very fair, and and that's kind of a a safe way to say it. Where like you know these guys and girls used it, they recorded a ton. So basically, anytime you're listening to the radio, you're going to come across the superphonic in w within a couple songs which uh some capacity yeah man i mean as as a ludwig guy that that has to be like a feather in the cap of ludwig where you know it's got to feel good just to know that this drum is part of culture it's part of history no doubt and i think towards i i think at, at that at the point especially like when you get to the 70s and the 80s it's very known you know the the significance of the history and the popularity and being a, at that point it's like it's undeniable they are titans and um heavy flex for them you know they always they they always i i think marketed their significance and contribution to snare drums you know and almost every drummer where you whether you play x brand or y brand like nine times out of ten you got a super in the collection for sure all right, so we're in the 60s. Ludwig is obviously, we all know in the 60s, Ludwig was uh, cranking out drums uh, for obvious uh, Ringo reasons and all that stuff. <laughs> um, then just moving forward, that's kind of the whole background of it, but moving forward through the decades, uh, 60s and 70s, I'm sure you see them a lot, and stop me if I'm missing anything, but uh, I know a lot of things changed in the 80s for drummers and drum sets with, with um, 
things coming in from overseas and Japanese brands, which are kind of went from the MIJ, like cheapo stencil world to like legitimate big boy brands. Um, oh, no. So I don't know what, what happened in those couple decades there. So when you look at the Superphonic, not much has really changed in, in, in the design of the shell, the makeup of the shell, but a lot evolved in sort of the exterior uh, components and hardware on it. So you look at the earlier examples uh, of the Superphonic, you know, 64 to let's say about 68, they were using the baseball bat muffler. Um, and then by 68, they transitioned to the tension knob, the circle round muffler. And then in 1970, you get the, the P85 throw off. It's no longer the, the P83 throw off. And then the batch changes, you move away from the Keystone era to now the era where uh, Ludwig II, the chief, is now president and CEO of the brand. Um, and you get to the line logo, you get to the blue olive badge kind of thing. But you know, you still have the imperial lugs, you still have the beaded shell, seamless aluminum, chrome plated, that never changes. And some of the componentry just kind of evolves over time. Um, at some point, the, the manufacturing of it moves from being a spun shell to a deep drawn shell, and then now to a hydroform shell, which is how we make them today. And we don't have all of the muffling componentry uh, the way you see it today, but we do have newer throw-offs. We have the, the P88, which is a really great, great throw-off. Uh, but all in all, the, the sound <laughs> to play off of, uh, I think this is very fitting, sound remains the same, right? Uh, Led Zeppelin, um, John Bonham, but really the sound of, of the Superphonic for the most part has remained the same because the, the construction of the shell, which is the core component of that drum, has not really changed in spec. It's still the same thickness. Um, it's still the same snare bed style, bearing edge style. Um, but the tolerances and the quality are just at a greater level today. That's awesome. And it really just goes to show that that shell construction is really the like heart of it. But the components can change around it because things like like throw offs and stuff like that, which which people have a lot of opinions about throw offs. That's kind of one of those debated things. But in your Ludwig meetings and stuff like that, and and, and is is the superphonic like something that comes up a lot about like um I don't know like we should update this, we should update this, or do you guys kind of leave certain things alone a little bit of like this is our our kind of flagship snare drum? Does that make sense? Like, is is there much thought of developing it right. further? Yeah, not much about development and, and the way we respond to development. And I always like to say this about the brand and kind of characterize a brand is this like Ludwig is the people's brand, right? We don't have the Ludwigs anymore, unfortunately, yeah. you know, but they were very much um, about the people and they built the brand and the products based on satisfying, you know, the needs of the drummer. And so they were very well connected with the drum community, the education community, and made all of these great products to provide solutions for better performance amazing and so like that's our committed we're what we're committed to as well we try not to stray away from that principle and that concept so we don't try to change things for the sake of changing them because yeah. we feel like we need to change them we respond to the player market you know whether it's the uh, professionals or artist group uh, or educators you know you always got to keep your ear to the ground and include them in the conversations and we look at the things that are problematic for players and and music evolves and players have evolved so the way they use a the product has evolved you know they use it with greater intensity like the p85 in the 70s was the end all be all and then like players weren't playing with the intensity that they play today yeah and so we've obviously evolved and stepped away from the stamped p85 design to the casted p88 design that's got a really great sort of uh wave lock um a type of device so that your wires don't back out over time and during play like the p85 tends to do if you're a heavier player sure. rarely does that if you're a lighter lighter style player but um you know sort of responding to the obvious to some players that are kind of you know it's sticking points with the product as you know players evolve and, and music evolves so yeah there's never been a need to look at that drum and say ah, we we could just always do it better yeah. that's <laughs> it's, yeah that's kind of something that in every industry people don't want to happen unless it's done and it's really successful so it's sort of a big giant gamble but uh i yeah i think everyone's like don't do it <laughs> yeah it. And, and and evolution is appropriate to some extent yeah. and and the way that and i think what has changed i mentioned you know the manufacturing of the drum from being spun to to deep drawn to now hydroform and that never really changed the 
um, the, the, the product by, by makeup or the archetype of the drum, what that really helped is help preserve the consistency of the product and the quality of the product. So one after the other, we're just like the last one, yeah. you know, where you, you're not trying to A and B five different superphonics to find the one. They're all the one because yeah. they're all made under the same strict tolerances and principles. And we're also able to manufacture them at a higher rate. Like we used to have really, uh, really extensive wait times for these drones because they're, you know, very difficult to manufacture yeah. at, at a very large scale. And it's still a very in demand drum. You're selling several hundreds, if not thousands of these drums a year. Yeah. Um, and so to keep up with demand, you need to find, um, you know, modern technology and manufacturing that could help you, uh, help your yield. You're essentially, you know, producing a lot more product at a much more comfortable pace so that you can deliver the product on time and you maintain the quality that you set forth in the product and also the costing of it, you know, sometimes investing in, in modern day manufacturing and techniques helps, you know, keep your costs uh, either the same or, or slightly less, you know, you, you kind of have to weigh a lot of the, uh, the economic factors into the equation, but yeah, I mean, that's basically it, you know, don't fix anything that isn't broken. And if there is something, bro you, you listen to the, to the people that play it and what that is and you respond to it. That's awesome. And so obviously, as we kind of get closer to the end here, people can still, I mean, superphonics are still available everywhere. I mean, they're, they're, they're affordably priced too. I mean, really for the, for the big picture of like a nice staple drum that like everyone can have, it's really not that ridiculous of a price. I mean, and, and I haven't looked in a little while, how much does a typical superphonic cost nowadays? It varies around the world. I know you have a global audience. Um, so, so like typically I, I think you can find uh, Supras with your retailers uh, just under like the 600 mark, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that is expect. I mean, that's not cheap, obviously, for someone who's like that. You could buy a drum set if you're just beginning. But for a pro snare that you could probably that's like a desert island snare that's very oh well, yeah without a doubt without a doubt and and it's fairly very fairly priced for for the professional totally. category you know there's definitely different categories are determined by you know pricing and 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 what goes into the manufacturing of the drum so to price a drum a lot less um, means that you don't have a lot of the same manufacturing time and investment that it goes to kind of make that type of drum yeah and i say that you're you're, you're cutting corners but um, it, it, you're finding cost savings where it exists. And with professional level drums, like when you really look at the process and the machinery involved to make this stuff and the hours, like that's what it costs. You know, they, they, just, they're not made in just an hour. You know, it takes, it takes a lot to, to, to hydro form a shell or the machinery actually to hydro. I mean, th these are some Goliath machines that, that do that process that are not cheap. You yeah. know, I imagine they're probably half a million to a million dollars. Uh, of a machine just to make that, that, that part for us. Wow. Um, and then you talk about, you know, and again, a lot of it is made in America still. So, you know, um, yeah. the finishing, the shell, everything. Um, and so that comes at a bit of a, of a premium, you know, to support, um, you know, American labor and, and such. And, uh, the finish, you know, high quality chrome plating, it's not an easy thing to do an easy process to go about either. Yeah. Um, and, totally. uh, yeah, so definitely, I think accurately priced for what goes into that drum. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'd put that in that like mid-range level where it's not a fifteen hundred dollar snare, but it's not a two hundred dollar snare. Where and also, it's kind of like one of those things where if you're going to buy a six hundred dollar snare, it's uh, it's not just like a on like like on a whim purchase. It's like really you you own it and you love it and you've saved up a little for it and you're uh, invested in it. So I think it's. Um, Super cool and uh, and man, what a piece of history! And and I'm glad you really know your stuff, dude. I mean, you are the Ludwig man. I mean, obviously, there's tons of Ludwig employees who know all their stuff, but uh, you're you're a great ambassador of the brand yourself. I think people just equate uh, Uli with with Ludwig. I mean, obviously, I, that's... I appreciate that. It means a lot. Um, it's very special to to hear that. But I, really, a lot of it comes from a lifelong obsession with the brand and such an affinity for the product. I grew up in Chicago. Yeah. And Obviously, Ludwig was founded in Chicago, and so a lot of that hometown pride as a drummer. Uh, once I made that connection early on, I was just obsessed, yeah. you know. And it's just really cool because the drum community, but especially the Ludwig drum community, is really amazing and very welcoming. And so I learned a lot through just 
being able to, to, to converse with, with cats and collectors and players that, that love the brand just as much and knew more than I did. And so just years of obsessing and living in that community, yeah. um, which is a very supportive and, and open and welcoming community has been great. And even conversing with yourself, you're a big part of this community. Oh, thank so you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And you know, something funny about Ludwig that I see a lot is uh, I see it with all kinds of drum uh, guys and girls, but like Ludwig guys, it'll be like, uh, like on Facebook, like they'll be posting pictures like with their families and they'll be like, like on a date with their wife and they're wearing a Ludwig t-shirt <laughs> like, or like a for semi-formal event. It'll be like, they'll still be wearing a Ludwig t-shirt. And it's just like, I love that man. I mean, there is some diehard passionate. <laughs> fans. It, it, it's a special brand. It's yeah. special to a lot of people um, and a lot of folks. And um, you know, that that's what kind of makes doing what we do even today as a company very special is, is how much is it, it's admired and even new new players are starting to experience the brand and, and to your point because of like family members, you know, yeah. dads, moms, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, what have you. Uh, so it's really cool to continue to see uh, so much appreciation from just a, a, a long generation of, of players, whether you're an up and coming player, aspiring player, you know, yeah, elementary, kinder age to yeah. today is, you know. Yeah, I've got, uh, I mean, I've got a little Ludwig accent set for my uh, two year old that he plays all the time. And it's like, you know, <laughs> I love all the brands, but I'm glad I always wanted one of those little accent kits as a kid. So I'm glad he could get it and uh, and play it. So um, awesome, Uli. Well, um, everyone listening, Uli's going to be kind enough to stick around and do a quick bonus episode uh, where we're going to talk about kind of, I asked him if there's any anomaly kind of drums uh, of superphonics. Like I almost equate it to like the stamp where the plane is upside down and it's worth like millions of dollars. So with superphonics, if there's anything that like, like weirdo drums that slipped out of the factory. So, um, and he said, yes. So we'll talk about that in the bonus episode. Uh, go to drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a Patreon link. Click that and uh, you can hear Uli's bonus episode and a bunch of others. But um, awesome. Uli, well, is there anything you want to like promote of your own while we're here at the end? Stuff you're working on or just Ludwig in general? Um, new stuff coming up kind of to wrap up? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're, since we're on the topic of snare drums, Ludwig has just launched the Universal Series snare drums, which is a new great snare drum line cool. uh, that is uh, universally priced. You know, you talk about price points, and, and this is a very attractive price point that we're able to hit and bring some really quality drums to the table. We have some uh, black, uh, uh, black nickel over brass models, an assortment of different woods. So we did, there's a ton of videos on, on YouTube, on social. So definitely subscribe to our YouTube, uh, check out the, the website that is Universal Series. Cool. Um, we're excited about that release. And this year, uh, it's the 50th anniversary of this Delight Drums. We'll be celebrating that all year. Awesome. Big, big deal. Yeah. I love, I loved your, your episode where you touch on uh, acrylic drums and we all know how special acrylic drums are, you know, the totally breathtaking looks and, and such a unique tone. But uh, yeah, we, we set out with a, a limited edition series of, of different pattern colors as well as snare drum. So another kind of cool snare drum uh, spotlight for us is in the Visalite 50th uh, assortment, product assortment. Cool. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if you want to follow any of my personal drum shenanigans, check out my Instagram site. Um, I like to post about drum restorations and, drums I collect and all that good stuff. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's, are you still Damon drums? D A M E N. Yeah. Instagram at Damon drums and Damon drums obviously comes from the Damon factory, the little Ludwig Damon factory yep. in Chicago. Yep. Cool, man. Ludwig is never sitting still and just letting things kind of be stagnant. You guys are always moving forward and uh, designing new stuff. So um, again, thank you to Pete Doan. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. D-O-A-N. And then uh, Nate Testa a while ago suggested this. So thanks to Nate. Um, and Uli, thank you for taking the time to be here with me today. We've had some technical difficulties, but I think we should uh, we'll wrap up before the computers explode and, uh, <laughs> and move forward. So Uli, thank you for being here. Bar, always a pleasure. Super honored to be a returning guest on your podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. <laughs>